health and wellness show today we feature the association of private hospitals of malaysia which is more commonly known as aphm this is an association representing private hospitals and medical centers in malaysia and has been in existence since 1972 it currently has over 100 members spread throughout malaysia now here to tell us more is its president dato dr kuljit singh now welcome to the show dato Hi, thanks for hosting me, Brian. Now, Dr. Kuljit, can you give us an overview of the APHM and specifically what it does? Okay, as you said, APHM uh, was first formed in 1972. Today, we've got 152 members. And uh, these are all hospitals which uh, have a hospital license registered with the Ministry of Health. In Malaysia, there are 210 plus private hospitals. But out of the 210 private hospitals, 152 of them are our members. The rest of them, which are not our members, are most likely small shop lot hospitals, which are not uh, our members as yet. But anyhow, we do represent uh, every private hospital uh, that's there in the country. And uh, we are basically an uh, association representing uh, private healthcare, uh, typically for hospitals. And we form one voice in terms of negotiating with the government in, uh, in terms like what we have right now with COVID. We find that uh, we significantly play a very important role as a link with the government uh, in terms of managing uh, different aspects uh, of the healthcare uh, modules that the government is now looking at, particularly in the pandemic. So this is a very good example when it comes to public-private public, pri public partnership, APHM plays a major role in it. Okay, I want to drill down a little bit into that because that is such a crucial role. Um, could you walk us through and tell us um, what was your role uh, with, for example, for a start, the vaccination process, and also in, in terms of consulting the government when this whole COVID situation hit the world? To start with, um, when COVID came uh, into existence, the first thing that the private hospitals um, offered to the government is that we were willing to do testing uh, for them. Testing for those who are going to pay for testing because uh, we were willing to do 24 hours testing for COVID. Uh, we started with uh, the RTK and then of course, uh, within a month or two, we started the PCR testing in almost every emergency department in the uh, private hospitals. We were not treating COVID patients until when the government decided that the private hospitals should start treating some COVID patients for paying patients. Because the government felt at that point of time when the numbers were actually quite low, comparatively speaking, that mm -hmm. there were a lot of patients that were going to the government sector, but they could actually pay for treatment. So we took up those patients who could pay and uh, there was quite a, a substantial amount at that point of time. Of course, today uh, we have no comparison because we are looking at uh, very huge numbers and the uh, majority of the patients are now in government, uh, government side. When the vaccines came into play in February, uh, the first step we did was uh, we told the government that we will take up the private healthcare vaccination program. Initially, the government was to vaccinate everyone, including the private healthcare. But we told the government that we will look after ourselves, just provide us the vaccines. And private healthcare, private hospitals will uh, vaccinate our own uh, private healthcare workers. And that was a good start for us because we picked up a lot of aspects of vaccine. And then we started the public vaccination program for the government through My Sujatra. So right now, almost every big private hospital has got a public vaccination center using the My Sujatra application. We also send our staff to the mega vaccination centers in Satya Alam, in KLCC, and maybe one or two more to assist them in the vaccination program. So we are working in this partnership uh, in COVID in various levels. Uh, doc, 
the government has started sending non-COVID patients to uh, the private institutions uh, who are your members. Um, how does that work out in terms of um, the financing? Who pays for this? Okay, there are pre-agreed um, uh, costs that the private hospitals and the Ministry of Health has agreed upon. Uh, the payment, if the patient is decanted or, or transferred from a private host, from a government hospital or private hospital, it is paid by the government. But the amounts that we have agreed are very much on a discounted rate because it is not our intention in, in the private uh, hospitals to make money, to make profit out of this. Our mere intention is to help the government to decant and to create space for the uh, patients who have COVID to be treated in the public sector. So it is all fully paid by the government, but it is kept regulated on a pre-agreed price. So we are happy to do it. Uh, some of the additional costs would be absorbed by the private hospitals uh, as a, a service to the government and to the people. But we are just probably getting enough to cover our costs to treat these patients when they get decanted to a private hospital. And obviously what's going to happen is it is going to take a tremendous a lot of stress out of the public system itself. Now, uh, because then the public system is overwhelmed. Now, can you uh, share with me, because you have been both an academic before as uh, 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 in a teaching hospital, as well as in government service, has the pandemic exposed any gaps in our healthcare system? I think one of the biggest things that we have seen uh, as, far, as far as gaps are concerned is the collaborative efforts that we should have had uh, between the public and private. Uh, we have seen this that a lot of patients wait for long periods of time in the public sector to get themselves treated, to get operated, and even to get for a simple uh, medical imaging in a, in a public sector can take a long time. At the same time, you have a lot of facilities in the private sector that are found to be vacant after hours, which the government can actually tap. So right now, oh, the government has enhanced buying services from the private sector, which has actually been in existence even before, but it's never been done in a big way. So I think this is something that we have learned through the pandemic. Right now, as we speak, patients are being, de uh, are being decanted to the private hospital. And now we understand what are the gaps, what are the shortcomings. And I think after this exercise, I see that in the future, a lot of uh, services can be bought from the private sector, which will ease the government sector, uh, the public sector healthcare service, which will enhance better delivery of care to the patients uh, in the uh, public sector. So I think these were the gaps that we didn't realize. But COVID, as I always say in most of my forums, there's always a silver lining for everything that happens. So you brought up a very interesting point because obviously now you've identified an opportunity for unused capacity in the, the private sector to be utilized by the public uh, sector. But there's also always a question of cost. How is that uh, uh, going to play out in the national health care budget moving forward? Because one of the gaps that is probably right now being exposed is the fact that uh, perhaps we could have a slightly underfunded healthcare system in the public system. Well, I think uh, the important thing that we need to look at is, uh, and the question that we need to ask, how much does it cost to fund a, a patient in the public sector? Because we don't have those kind of figures. If you're going to go for the appendicectomy or you're going to go for a cardiac surgery in the public sector, how much does it really cost? We do not have those kind of figures, but in the private sector, we can tell you through itemized billing exactly how much a medical procedure or treatment will cost. Now, in our belief that, you know, we in private sector will definitely do our costing in a very uh, much regulated because we do have to make certain amount of profit in our system and at the same time deliver the best health care. Uh, because patients are paying, there should be value for money, there should be patient satisfaction, there should be good outcomes. All of that is calculated in our bill. So definitely 
there is a time that we need to sit together will it be more cost effective that certain procedures can be done privately and probably the government may save more money by buying some of our services instead of they building more hospitals uh, trying to fund manpower trying to use the capital expenditure to build more and more government hospitals but not able to sustain a good human resource like doctors and specialists and uh, the rest of it trained doctors and specialists for example so then uh, there are a lot of these discussions that hasn't been answered. We have a lot of private hospitals, uh, which are probably capable enough of taking up some of that uh, patients in the public sector. And in the long run, probably the government will save a lot more money. Now, uh, Dr. Koji, you brought up a couple of good, really good points that I want to drill down further. But the first thing I want to talk about is, since we're on the topic of cost, is healthcare inflation on the public uh, on the private side of healthcare, in the last decade, healthcare costs have been increasing by double digit annual numbers. Now, most Malaysians are not insured or underinsured. And our, that is one of the challenges of the, the, the public health system because the public health system, on the other hand, is little or no cost to the patient. Now, what's the way forward? Why is there so much of healthcare in cost increase on the, in the private sector? Healthcare in general is not cheap. It is not cheap in the government and it's not cheap in the private. The only difference is if you get treatment in the government, it is not free. The government is paying for it. Yes. And the cost that they're paying for it is probably equivalent to what we pay in private or probably even more uh, because the system of procurement may differ a little bit from what we do in private. So there are different layers of how uh, procurement is done in the government sector. But leaving that aside, uh, all medical equipment, medic medications that we get, uh, both public and private uh, sector, it is all procured internationally. We do not have a large uh, local manufacturing um, source. Like if you were to buy a CT scan machine, MRI, Medicare, everything is procured internationally. And that all depends on what kind of exchange rate we're talking about. So when the exchange rates are not favorable, and as time goes by, medical equipment, medications do get expensive in several folds. So what CT scan machine that you have bought 10 years ago and what you're buying today, the cost is extremely uh, different. So when you look at that, it is very difficult to control the inflation. It is not that the private sector is trying to make more money. We are probably having the same margins but at a higher cost because of the healthcare globally has become expensive and it will become expensive. And as I said, it very much depends on what kind of exchange rate you're doing. Unless you have got homegrown medical equipment, medical uh, medications that you are having in your own country, for example, like in India, like China, they have a lot of homegrown technology that you buy uh, locally that you don't have to rely on buying uh, equipment and medication from overseas. Now, Doc, then is that the way forward for Malaysia in terms of cost containment? Because you, you use India as an example. Some of their pharmaceuticals are a tenth of the price of what they would cost in Malaysia. Right. So that's why the, the, the cost in India uh, and also other parts of the world, when they have their own medical industry, they can contain the cost uh, quite reasonably. But having said that, we have seen medical tourists in 2018 and 2019 flocking more to Malaysia than the other neighboring countries. We saw a certain surge of medical tourists choosing Malaysia over the other so-called well-established medical tourist uh, destination. And the reason that we asked medical tourists why they picked Malaysia is because they found that treatment in Malaysia was more cost effective which a Malaysian will not be able to appreciate it, but a medical tourist is able to compare what they pay in a neighboring country and what they paid in Malaysia. We were far more affordable, comparatively speaking. That itself is a testimony that we are not as expensive as how we may think we are. But of course, to a Malaysian who's uninsured, paying out of pocket, it may seem to be expensive in the private healthcare. Now, Dr. Kuljit, on the topic of medical tourism, um, and obviously we're talking about pre-COVID numbers. Where were the bulk of the uh, uh, patients coming from to, for your members? 
Okay, we largely saw patients from Indonesia. We also saw patients coming from Bangladesh, from India, and then we also had some flow from China, uh, not in a big number. We had medical tourists even coming from Europe and Australia for cosmetic surgery in Malaysia. But the large group was actually Indonesian. Uh, so uh, they basically used to go to many parts of other areas within our country. And, uh, but, but they certainly felt that Malaysia was a better destination in terms of cost and quality of healthcare. Quality could be equal, but the, it was more cost effective coming to Malaysia. And the other thing that Malaysia had a bit of an extra age with Indonesia is our connectivity increased very well in the last 10 years because of alliances like Air Asia uh, flew directly from many cities in Indonesia to Kuala Lumpur. That made a huge difference to Malaysia as far as Indonesian medical tourists were concerned. And have, uh, uh, for your members, is medical tourism a significant uh, chunk of their business today, uh, pre-COVID? And, and again, pre-COVID, because I think post-COVID, we'll probably see a return to those pre-COVID sort of numbers once things settle down. But we're in an abnormally right now. Well, many hospitals, we had close to 50% or probably with 60% of medical tourists, especially in Malacca and in Penang. The other hospitals in other areas in Kuala Lumpur had about 10 to 20 percent of medical tourists. So it varies from a hospital to hospital. You must remember some of the private hospitals in Malaysia were dominated by the local crowd and there was much, not much of space for medical tourists. But there are also some private hospitals that they were designed specifically for medical tourists as they could see the numbers going up. So we definitely uh, picked up very well. Uh, particularly in 2018 and 2019, and we projected 2020 to be a booming year for medical tourism. But unfortunately, we had another uninvited guest called COVID. Yes, unfortunately. Now, what I want to uh, zoom in on the, the medical profession itself uh, and the APHM. What are the key things that are facing the profession right now and also your members? One of the key things you mentioned just now is uh, which you touched on briefly, was really uh, the quality of the human capital from the government sector. And, and there's, there seems to be a mismatch between demand and supply of medical professionals. Could, could you kind of elaborate on some of the challenges facing your profession right now? Well, medical uh, profession would be mainly two categories. There would be specialist and nursing. Uh, well, a lot I would say 95% or 90% of the medical specialists who are working in private had worked in the government service. We were trained in government service uh, and then we served and then we came out and started practicing in the private sector. That gives a little bit of a constraint to the government because there is a huge mismatch in, in earnings. Uh, the government is not able to give that kind of um, of uh, earning power to the public sector specialists. Hence, there's a little bit of a brain drain. But having said that, uh, the government now has opened up that the uh, government servant, a government doctor, a government specialist is allowed to also spend some hours or some days in the private sector, and which is actually quite good. So there's a little bit of uh, containment of, uh, of uh, specialists leaving from their sector to our sector. Nursing can be a bit of an issue because even in the private sector, we cannot match uh, the kind of packages they get in the Middle East. Uh, a, a nurse that gets three to 5,000 in, uh, in a private hospital may get up to 12 to 18,000 uh, ringgit per month in a Middle East uh, hospital without tax. So we do lose a lot of nurses to the Middle East and that becomes a huge concern to us. Uh, not so much with the specialists, but I think the nursing can be a problem. Uh, sometimes because we are not allowed to take any foreign nurses at this point of time. We have to use local nurses. Now, doctor, the training of future specialists is also a big factor because um, especially given this contract doctor issue, which is a hot potato right now. Um, could you kind of give us a perspective? Because one of the key issues that they talked about was really the fact that 
their ability to get specialist training um, is basically cut off because they are on a contract uh, with the government. Because the systems uh, they are in place are not in tandem uh, with the processes that they have decided uh, on the other end of the whole ecosystem. The systems dictate that in order to be a specialist or to do any kind of specialization in our local universities, you will have to be a full time doctor in the Ministry of Health or probably even in the university. But let's talk just about the Ministry of Health. You need to be permanent before you can get a scholarship that is kind of forced upon you because with the scholarship from the public service department, you are then bonded to work for the government about five to seven years. So that is a pathway that has been there for time immemorial. But on the other hand, the government has then decided that we are not going to give permanent post to everyone. Some will have permanent posts and some will be on contract. So that's where the disjoint will occur. The, the ones with permanent posts will have an opportunity to become specialists and a huge chunk of them are on contract. So they have to make a decision that uh, either you give long-term contracts and allow contracts uh, or medical officers to pursue postgraduate and in order so that they can also become specialists. So that's the disjoint that they are still discussing and how they are going to do. Are they going to give long-term contracts or are they going to allow uh, people on long-term contracts to take up specialization, to forego that criteria that have been there for many years. I came through an old system that everybody got permanent jobs uh, 20 years ago when we joined uh, as medical officers. And we were all on pensionable schemes, uh, whichever way you look at it. And our career pathways just moved on as we went along, but it is not the case right now. But is there a role then for APHM and its members to, to play in the training of specialists? Because the problems also lie in the fact that given the pipeline and given things that we are, we, we are, we are short of specialists in certain key areas in Malaysia, we may have a problem 10 years down the track with a lack of specialists given our size of our population. There are two private entities uh, in the private healthcare uh, system that have already started uh, training specialists. One is the KPJ uh, University, which train uh, doctors into certain specialized uh, uh, areas. And then uh, we also hear that Sunway has started a program to, uh, in this uh, specialization uh, uh, a program whereby doctors can get themselves specialized, but it's all done in a very small way. The problem in Malaysia is not like the United States, whereby um, in the United States, they have got huge uh, research, university, hospitals, research uh, branches with uh, training programs which are privately owned or missionarily owned, like the John Hopkins and the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic. They work on a very different concept where it is privately owned, but they get a lot of grants from the government to run training programs. So it is amalgamated together where you can, uh, it is a private entity, but become a specialist. So uh, for us to reach to that level is going to take a lot of time because private hospitals may not have a complete case mix to train a specialist to the level comparable to what you have in the government sector. So when I got trained as an ENT surgeon in the government sector, uh, in, I was trained in University of Malaya for four years. I was exposed to a big amount of case mix in order for me to have adequate exposure to be a specialist. So that's, that are the concerns uh, in the private hospitals in Malaysia because we may not have that. But I believe as we go along, we should be able to attain such kind of a level that we could be comparative to what you do in the university in the private sector, uh, public sector, sorry. Now, I, I want to talk about the digital health because this uh, pandemic has really then opened the floodgates in terms of telemedicine and so forth. So how are your members then evolving and offering new services to take advantage of technology? Telehealth, uh, it's a very good uh, platform for consultation with patients, particularly when there is difficulty for patients to meet the doctor uh, 
because particularly now with the pandemic, it becomes even more challenging. But having said that, there are limitations in telemedicine. Uh, when you look at medicine, medicine is not comparable to e-commerce. In e-commerce, you can buy a product online, pay through credit card, and then you get your, uh, your goods or your purchases delivered to your doorstep. But in healthcare, you're limited. Number one, if, if you want to consult a patient for the first time, uh, and you, are, you have no ability of examining the patient or investigating the uh, patient, then it is very difficult for a doctor to come up with a diagnosis and then even prescribe medication. So medicine is a bit different because if I just sit and talk to you and listen to your symptoms, they are, it is not going to be good enough to come yes. up with a diagnosis. If you are a follow-up patient, then again, it depends. If you have seen me yesterday, and you have got further questions to ask me, yes, you can log on and we can continue our consult uh, in terms of question and answers. But if you have change of symptoms, then again, I need to examine you again. What was yesterday, it may not be the same today. Again, it will be wrong for me now to tell you, increase your medication, decrease your medication, add on another medication because I've not examined you. So there are limitations when using telemedicine uh in these terms uh many people think that telemedicine is the same like e-commerce no it doesn't work that way no. yeah uh, so so we need to understand that doctors need to understand that the patients need to understand that that uh, having a 20 minutes consult only talking about your symptoms and then the doctor will send you an email print out the prescription go to the pharmacy and get your medication it doesn't work that way now, Doc, I want to come back to APHM and, and ask you, what are your, for, for you and your executive team at APHM, what's the goals and plans moving forward for APHM? I think the most important thing that we are looking at is that we, we want to work closely with the government. Uh, we know there are a lot of smart partnerships that we can do with the government, uh, particularly now we can see how important working together will make a lot of sense. So APHM has always maintained this, that you know, at any time uh, there's any collaborative effort with the government, we should be able to work it out seamlessly to help both parties. But at the same time, uh, we are very concerned. Sometimes the government has got very rigid uh, regulatory uh, effect to the private sector, which sometimes can make it difficult for us to function. But in our last couple of years, we found that our collaborative effort has made us understand that regulatory is actually good for the patient in terms of patient safety. Many years ago, when there was no private healthcare facility act, uh, there was not much of patient safety elements in the private healthcare. Today, we have a lot of uh, patient safety elements in within the private healthcare, which is regulated by the government. But we are more concerned sometimes when the government tend to encroach in areas of costing, charges, which sometimes can strangulate our businesses because they may not understand that we survive on what we get paid for. We do not get any grants or support from any uh, government entity. So whatever we have in the hospital, lock, stock and barrel staffing, infrastructure, capex, is all on our own. So we need to sometimes sustain ourselves, not to make big profits. The wrong notion goes out to the public and also to the government that we make a lot of money. Uh, it is not true because a lot of money that is, uh, uh, whatever a lot of money that we get out of our business, it is channeled back into the business in order to sustain and also to keep up the standards. And which is, as I mentioned earlier, Healthcare is not cheap. Now, Dr. Kuljit, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks for bringing it on the show and thanks for being a great guest. Thank you. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez and I've been speaking to Dato Dr. Kuljit Singh, the president of the Association of Private Hospitals of Malaysia on Vistax Health and Wellness Show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites as well as our website, www.vistax.asia. Please subscribe and like our Facebook and LinkedIn platforms as well. Thank you very much for tuning in.